Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, I am not a medical expert, not a radiologist or oncologist, but I am somewhat of an expert in what it's like to be diagnosed with cancer and go through all of the prescribed treatments, which for me included surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and brachytherapy, and what it's like to live with some of the consequences that can sometimes follow uh, pelvic radiation and hopefully shed some light on what that's like for us. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer in February of 2012. At the time it was caught in an early stage, I was stage 1A. I had a 97% chance of surviving it. So I did everything they said to do. My treatment was over in July of 2012. And I was told to go on and, and have a great cancer-free life. Uh, all was supposed to be well, but that's not exactly what happened. About six months into my new cancer-free life, I began to experience uh, some severe digestive issues. Now, when I went through radiation, I had been told that during the actual process, during that six weeks, I would suffer some discomfort that I might have stomach pain or fatigue or diarrhea, but that that was normal and it would pass when the treatment ended. Uh, these symptoms were a little bit different. For one thing, um, these symptoms were more severe, and the pain, the abdominal pain that I experienced was, I would have to say at times, crippling. Um, I would be doubled over. I had no idea what might be causing it, so I contacted the doctors that I was seeing, and at that time, that was my radiologist and my oncologist, whom I was seeing every three months, and my primary care physician. None of them seemed to give it much credence. Um, one of them told me to drink more water. One of them told me I should start taking a probiotic. And one of them suggested that I take uh, an antidepressant because I might be sad. I wasn't sad at all. I was happy to have beat cancer. So it didn't seem uh, relevant to me, but I did start drinking more water, and I did start taking a probiotic. However, the pain continued, and it got worse. Um, by three or four more months with no relief, I sought out a gastroenterologist who uh, gave me bento for the pain, but again, no explanation for what might be happening. He did bring up a couple of other illnesses that might be possible, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, um, but said he wasn't sure. And uh, meanwhile, while these episodes were occurring on a regular basis, um, it was affecting my life in many ways, socially as well as professionally. Um, because I am a writer and communications consultant by profession, I'm frequently out in the public doing uh, special events and fundraising, and this became problematic for me. Um, I was terrified about when the symptoms might come up, when I might have an episode. So the only way I could ensure that it wouldn't is that uh, the day of an event, I didn't eat. And the day before a really long event, <clears throat> I didn't eat. So I wasn't gaining weight, and I wasn't having the carefree life I was expecting. Uh, this went on for close to a year. And in the meantime, I got another primary care physician to see if possibly um, she might find something. <clears throat> but again, um, I was given no explanation, just that, you know, sometimes um, cancer treatment it can be a little rough on somebody, but that it would pass, and it, it, it wasn't. Around that time, a seemingly unrelated incident occurred. Uh, I was out watering the lawn one evening, and I was seized with a tremendous amount of pain in my right leg. Um, when I say tremendous, it, it felt like someone was lighting a match to me. So uh, I spoke again with my radiologist and oncologist. They considered maybe I pulled a muscle. I went to a neurologist and was given gabapentin. I was also given Flexeril um, because I was told that perhaps I pulled a muscle. I had never pulled a muscle before watering the lawn, so that didn't seem right to me. And I think about that time is when I decided uh, maybe I should do some research on my own. Um, while I was doing research, I saw a pain doctor, and she remains the only doctor who uh, related my treatment to something that was happening to me now. She pulled down a textbook and said, 
you have this symptom and this symptom and this symptom, then I believe that there has been damage done to the femoral nerve. And she diagnosed it as radiation-induced lumbosacral plexopathy. There's no cure for it. It's progressive. And in her sweet opinion, what are you going to do? So she gave me pain medicine, medicine and sent me on my way. And I continued uh, my research. I wondered if, if uh, radiation could do something to that nerve. Could it also be responsible for the digestive issues that I was having? Now, in the beginning, I wasn't putting in the right the right research words. I was typing in late effects of radiation and side effects of radiation, not coming up with much. And then finally I came across a study done by Dr. Jervois Andreab in London, and he coined a phrase, pelvic radiation disease. And the more I read, the more I realized that's what I have. So I found no doctor here in America who was able to speak with me about it, so I contacted him. I didn't think he would write me back, but he did, and we began a series of email exchanges. He sent me information. I learned all about the algorithm. I learned all about the 23 symptoms. I learned that it was highly recognized throughout Europe, that patients um, had even started their own Facebook page and a pelvic radiation disease association, and yet here you couldn't find that term anywhere. So uh, I took the information that I got from Dr. Andreov to several doctors here. I don't believe they read it. I left them with it, and that's the last I heard of it. Uh, Dr. Andreov also put me in touch with a doctor here, Dr. Martin Howard Jensen, and he also confirmed that yes, pelvic radiation disease is, is a real thing. It doesn't affect everybody who has had pelvic radiation, but it affects a lot of people. And so I thought, well, maybe together we could put some kind of article out there about it. I have a background in broadcast media. I was a reporter at CNN and television stations and a newspaper. And I thought, surely I could get it published. The tough part I had was with the exception of Dr. Howard Jensen and Dr. Andreoff, no other doctor in America would admit to the reality of, of pelvic radiation disease or even damage. So uh, as I pursued the article, I got in touch with a number of women who were gynecologic cancer survivors, and in all, I interviewed 15. Every one of them had experienced some sort of digestive disorder, and in some cases, their symptoms were far worse than mine. Uh, I spoke with one woman who had been housebound for six years because her symptoms were so bad, she gradually had to withdraw from her family life, her social life, her professional life, and um, she had all but given up. I remember that when we spoke on the phone the first time, um, for the entire first hour, there, were no, there was no conversation because she couldn't stop crying. Eventually, <clears throat> I put the article together and I, I got the Foundation for Women's Cancer to agree to put it on their website. Uh, there was some resistance initially. They didn't want to offend the uh, gynecologic oncology community. So there was a little bit of, of time that went by before they finally gave the go-ahead. The problem is that although the article is out there, it's on a website that not that many people see, and thus the women have no access to it. Uh, quite frankly, information about pelvic radiation disease is in your circle. Uh, the information and the evidence that's out there is in the publications that you read. We're getting ladies' home journal and coupon books and, and clothing catalogs. Uh, you're getting the medical publications. And so we wonder why you won't bring it out of the closet to us and why it's being withheld. We know that radiation saves lives, but we also know that in many cases there are consequences to radiation. We, we know through the studies of Dr. Andreov and Dr. Howard Jensen that there are things that can be done, that we can get our lives back, um, that treatment options and ways to manage our symptoms are not available to us. You know, when our medical needs are not addressed, our physical needs are not addressed, and that then affects our social needs, which then affects our, our professional and financial needs, and all of a sudden, if the symptoms that you're going through um, affect every level of your life, 
you're not getting better at all. Um, we're told to go on and have a, a wonderful life, which we want to do, but we're quitting our jobs. Um, we're withdrawing from dinner parties and social events because we don't know when an episode might occur. Um, these are difficult things for women to talk about and even difficult for them to talk about to their doctors. Um, it takes a lot of courage, a lot of bravery to stand up and talk about your colon or talk about the things that are happening within your body. And all we want is the same kind of bravery and courage for the medical community to step forward and be thought leaders in that area and embrace and accept that pelvic radiation consequences do exist and help us learn what we can do about them. You know, every year about 95,000 women are diagnosed with gynecologic cancer. Um, that means that just in the three years that I've been dealing with cancer, um, close to 300,000 women have been diagnosed. 50% of the ones with cervical cancer are going to receive radiation treatment. 35 to 40% of those with uterine cancer are going to receive radiation treatment, and the list, the list goes on. That's a lot of women and a lot of radiation. It's a lot of patients that need to be helped. You know, when I first wrote the article that went on the Foundation's website, I titled it The New Radium Girls. I'm sure you, more than any other community, are familiar with the Radium Girls, who in the 1920s uh, took jobs painting clock dials with fluorescent paint that contained radium. And over time, they began to have horrific illnesses and cancers, and they died. In fact, the week that my story went online, the last of the radium girls had died at 104 years old. When they tried to bring their concern that radium was the cause of their illnesses, they were dismissed and they were discounted. In fact, the newspapers, to discredit them, uh, reported that it was symptoms of syphilis. But eventually, the truth came out. And as one of the women I interviewed noted, um, our truth just simply has yet to come out. Um, in closing, I want you to know that just last week I spoke with the woman who had been housebound for six years, and I learned something uh, astounding and wonderful. Um, she had had an infection, and it had abscessed and created a wound on her abdomen. She was hospitalized. It didn't go away. Uh, she was in wound care for months, and then she was transferred to a rehab unit and it took several more months. As a last resort, her doctor ordered hyperbaric treatment. And what's interesting is, not only did it heal the wound, but it made a dramatic difference in the digestive issues that she'd been suffering all these years. In fact, it made such a difference, she told me that she was able to eat fairly normally again, and she even had gone back to work and taken a part-time job. Now, hyperbaric treatment is indicated in Dr. Andreev's studies as one of the treatments that can assist in the symptoms of pelvic radiation disease. My question and hers is, why did she have to wait six years to get relief and then really by accident? You know, I think the bottom line is that our symptoms are not in our heads. They're in our bodies, and I recognize that they do mirror uh, symptoms of other illnesses like Crohn's disease or celiac disease or IBD, but essentially we're being treated for those illnesses, and that's not what we have. We're being treated for illnesses with medications that we don't necessarily need. We're being denied tests and, and uh, screenings that we do need, and in many cases, uh, we're being given advice and information aimed at calming us instead of curing us. Uh, I think it's very clear that information and evidence about the reality of pelvic radiation disease is out there. Only as patients, we don't have access to it. I, I mentioned earlier that I was diagnosed with cancer in February of 2012. And exactly three years to the day, um, I learned that my cancer had returned and metastasized, and I, in February, was given six to nine months to live. Now, I know that my treatment and pelvic radiation did not cause the return of my cancer, but I do wonder 
if it might have been possible if any of the eight doctors I saw had ever taken me seriously and aggressively investigated my symptoms, would they have come up with evidence that I had cancer again uh, before it was too late to do anything about it? So in closing, I want to thank you for your time. You are among the most brilliant minds, the doctors and the scientists, and uh, you're working in one of the most advanced fields in medicine. Um, and it's our hope that the American medical community uh, will very soon embrace public radiation disease and damage as a reality because the truth is it's affecting a lot of women and a lot of those women are not getting the help that they need and deserve. So thank you for your time.